Well, hello and welcome to Joshua number 14. We are still in this book going strong and we are now in chapter 11 and we're going to look at the other side of Canaan, the conquest of northern Canaan. Now we're going to try and utilize some maps um, in this lecture, in this message. Now for those of you at home, I don't know how well it will turn out on the screen. Uh, and this is primarily built for in person, so I want to encourage you, if you're close by, if you can come, be here in person. You're never going to match what the Spirit of the Lord does in the services. He doesn't do the same thing uh, through recordings. I just know that for a fact. So we encourage you to be with us. Well, when you begin to look, you're going to see in the next screen, uh, maps going to come up on your left hand side, and then there's going to be enough room for a map on the right hand side. It won't come up just yet. And of course, in our regular lectures, we're going to be using a laser pointer to point some of these things out. I'll try to avoid uh, trying to do that since it's not going to work anyway. Um, but I, I want to show you at least the idea of the Southern Conquest and put it on a map so that you can kind of see it. And we're going to focus in on just a slight bit of the history here um, where it talks about after defeating the five kings at Makeda, Israel then made their way through the land, defeating Libna, Lachish, Eglon, Hebron, and Debir. And then at Lachish, Gezer attacked Israel, and Israel destroyed them. And you can see, if you can at all, the red line that's coming down, and that shows Gezer's attack. Uh, and the blue line, of course, representing Israel's conquest as they went through the land. Now, these facts are important to remember because it's these very battles along with the previous ones that included God throwing rocks and changing the orbit of the planet so as it could destroy their, their enemy. All of those things come up because in this next chapter, chapter 11, it says when Jabin heard all of these things. So we want to be able to look at that. Now, in this too, um, we can see just a little bit uh, more of how Israel continued on through southern Canaan, destroying all these Canaanite cities. They completed their conquests. That's what we were talking about. They were consistent in their conquest. This took a long time to do, but they were consistent, always doing what the Lord commanded them to do. And they were controlled in their conquest. Ah, got in last week's outline already there. It was controlled because God fought for him. God predetermined the end, the outcome. That little statement of God fighting for them, just think about that, what if that means, that God enabled them, God strengthened them, God watched over them, God fought for them and within them and through them. You begin to get the picture. I mean, he even killed more of the enemy by his rock throwing than they did with their swords. So the encouragement from this lesson is to assist us in the fact of knowing that God is assisting us. He strengthens us. He cheers us. He will lead us. He will help us in every situation. Now, as well as noticing that Southern campaign, you also want to see a little picture anyway of our Northern campaign, which is where we're at now in chapter 11. And you may not be able to read it. The boxes are there. There's a, a box one, box two, box three. Our live audience will be able to see it. And I'm going to read those and make some uh, notations. And in fact, in a lot of those, their verses may show up. I may not quote them, uh, but they're there to let you know the facts. You can read them at the same time I'm talking. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, can't we? And that way you can know some of the things that are going on, but they'll appear on the screen. In this northern campaign, it starts off, and it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things. Oh, he heard about all these victories in the south, and what did he do? He gathered this great alliance 
of northern armies to fight against Israel. Now, this is exactly what happened with the previous king of Jerusalem. Same thing that he heard, he gathered everybody together, and then they went to fight. And in fact, this alliance was huge. Um, the scriptures give it to you that this was even as the sand of the sea. There was a multitude. If you look at it, they went out and they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude. And we see they had horses and chariots. It's a huge army. It's organized. It's equipped for battle. They mean business. But then we find out from that God steps in to let Joshua know what's going on. You have to think about it, Christian. Your enemy is organized. Your enemy is ordered. Uh, that's why it talks about uh, in when we're putting on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then it talks about that we may be able to fight against the uh, rulers of darkness. All that ordered uh, enemy uh, way that they are organized and how that they fight. They're everywhere. Same thing with your flesh. Your flesh, yeah. Paul said, it's everywhere. How, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Everywhere I go, I find a skirmish. I find a battle. Or I find all-out war. But hang on, because then we see that Joshua is going to have the victory that Joshua is promised this. Everywhere you turn, there's a fight. Yes, sir, but God told Joshua he would have the victory in verse 6 against this army. And so you're going to read a little bit later, too, that Israel marched on them from Gilgal in a surprise attack and defeated them. Like you can see it where he talks about, you know, this is amazing to me. Here's, what does he say? Don't be afraid of them. And here's why. Because I'm going to deliver up to you this enemy and they will be, the wording in this is amazing, they will be as good as dead. That's the state that God's going to deliver them. What does that sound like? Absolute victory. Get the picture of it? He is promising Joshua victory and he promises to us victory. It's just as if the ones that are coming against you are as good as dead already. So understand this. Don't be afraid. I'm still fighting for you. And this is what I'm going to do. And that's what he says. Now, if we understand anything about the New Testament, we understand that God is telling us the same thing. Don't be afraid because I'm still fighting for you. And here's what I'm doing for you. I'm building hope. And hope doesn't make you ashamed. You see, tribulation, and this is from Romans 3, 5 through 5, but he says, tribulation builds experience, and experience builds hope. And this hope is never empty. It maketh not ashamed. It's never vain. This hope that God builds in us through the tribulation and through the experience will always come to pass. Now, just as a side note, you see at the bottom of your screen there where it says, thou shalt hew their horses and burn their chariots with fire. You might know specifically what the burning of the chariots is, but how about hewing the horse? Just so you'll know, to hew a horse means to hamstring it. The purpose was to render the horse useless to a rider or for any use of war. Now, Israel's king, they were told back in Deuteronomy 17 and 16 that they were not allowed to increase the number of horses for war. They were not allowed to depend upon the cavalry. They were supposed to depend upon God. The king was not allowed to use horses to show off his regal position because his regal position was the favored one of God. So what did they do? Since they can't use the horses, they didn't kill all those horses. They rendered them useless, not usable. 
Now I want you to also notice verse 7, where it says, So Joshua came and all the people of war with him. This is after that promise. Don't be afraid. Come on, this is what I'm going to do. And here's how they responded. They came up to the waters of Miram suddenly, and they fell upon them. Now, if you notice, there's quite a distance between Gilgal and this new town, Miram. And so all of a sudden, you see that Joshua shows up. This means, man, he took off immediately. When God made him that promise, he took off. He traveled fast, and he caught them unprepared. But it was because he was obedient to God's plan and because he believed God's promise that he was successful. Do you believe God's promise? Do you move according to God's plan? Do you hear and believe? Do you respond like Joshua? Let me go a little bit further. We've got another box, box number three up there, where it talks about how that after they came upon them and fought that initial battle, that Israel chased their enemies as far as Sidon, as great Sidon, as, and Misripoth Mayim, then returned and, and burned Hazar to the ground. You can see that over on the left-hand side of your screen with the verses, and Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. Now, that's quite a distance to have to travel, to continue to fight, to persist. But Israel smote them, and they chased them. Joshua went the distance in doing what the Lord bade him. That means God told him some specifics, and he did exactly what God told him to do. And in fact, you'll find that in the very next verse, in verse 10, where it says, And Joshua at that time turned back again and took Hazar. What does it mean he turned back? He must have passed the city by. He must have gone right by it because he's got a special for this uh, king and for this city. And it says, And he smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazar before time was the head of all those kingdoms. He was the one that got everybody together to come against and fight Israel. So now Joshua turns his attention to the one who started this whole thing. And he turns back. Well, what does he turn back from? From pursuing the enemy who was running away. In other words, once the job was completed, he turns his attention to Hazar and its king, and he destroys them. He leaves nobody alive and then burns the city to the ground. Well, that left a pretty strong message to any who would listen, that if you're seeking to get others against Israel, you're going to be the favored one to be destroyed Last and worst, nothing will be left. No one allowed to breathe any longer, and your city will be destroyed. Now, all the other cities, we know and we can see how that Israel was allowed to take their spoils, probably live in some of those cities, take their cattle. Um, in fact, you can see it in verse 14 where it says, And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. So Israel could dwell in them. They could take the livestock, the properties, the dwellings, everything there would now become the property of Israel. All of this because we see too that as the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. And then what? And so did Joshua. That's like Jesus was commanded, well, he committed to himself to keep the law and do everything that his father told him to do. He was victorious. That's our victory. You notice else, what else it says? He left nothing undone of all the Lord commanded Moses. And can you say that, that you've ne left nothing undone? Well, I am so glad that when it comes to our salvation, that Jesus left nothing undone. He paid for every sin. He comforts every pain. He supplies our every need. 
whether it's strength or whatever it might be, Jesus leaves nothing undone. And what do we find then? Verse 16. So Joshua took all that, uh, all that land, the hills and all the south country and all the land of Goshen and the valley and the plain and the mountain of Israel and the valley of the same. And notice verse 18. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Doesn't mean he persisted in war, making war. It means it took him a long time to finish the battle. You know, you and I can read through this whole battle and the campaign quickly. You could read chapter 10 and chapter 11 and include chapter 12 and 13, and it would be over and done with very short order. But this was a campaign of clearing the land of the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Pezzarites, and all of the other ites that we've been talking about. Some say that this was a five-year campaign, while others say it took up to seven years. Well, I'm going to say this about that. We don't know exactly how long, but I do know this. Five is the number of grace. And grace enables us to do whatever God has called us to do. And seven is the number for perfection. You encourage how many ever years it, it took to encourage you the most. The fact is the battle is not a quick one. In years, it took years. You know what? Most of the time, Christians, we want it over and done with. We need to understand that Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. He left nothing undone. That's Jesus. But for you and I, we need to persist. We need to keep on going. But here's the other interesting thing. The fact that it was not quick. Look at what happened too. And it says there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel Save who? The Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all other they took in battle. Huh. Imagine that. When you read this verse, not a city made peace with them except the Gibeonites. Sounds like the Gibeonites had a good, pretty good plan now, and it makes you wonder a little bit. But then when you read the very next verse, now remember this, nobody made peace with Israel. They had to battle. Why is that? Verse 20. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. We need to understand there is no reformation possible of the flesh. It cannot be reformed. It must be utterly destroyed. And that's what Jesus Christ does for us in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When you put this into the story about being hardened for a particular purpose, you know, you ought to be, I would think, be familiar with Pharaoh and how that God hardened his heart. The Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return unto Egypt, see that thou do all your wonders right in front of Pharaoh. What does he say? Which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart that he will not let the people go. We read this, we can read the same thing about Sihon, but Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate why? That he might deliver him into thine hand as appeareth to this day. This is all for God's glory and that his glory might be put on full display in his sovereignty, his holiness, his justice, and his righteousness. If you're lost and listening to this, judgment is coming to everyone. Will you reject God as these heathen nations did? Will you reject him unto the judgment that's coming? Or would you rather come to Jesus, be a follower of Jesus, submit to him as your God, as your Lord, and as your Savior? Then I want to skip down to our last verse. Verse 23. 
And notice this, for it says, so Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel, according to their division by their tribes. And the land rested from war. Ah, amazing. Joshua took the whole land and then the land rested from war. I like that last sentence. This was, as he said earlier, a long campaign, not just of battling, but think about it. We saw it in this lesson, how that all the way from Gilgal up to Mimram, that he had that battle, he had to travel. So you have this army that you've got to get ready. They've got to try, travel. They've got to fight. They've got, got to carry on the daily routines and needs of their own body. There's the organizing of an army. And with Joshua, he was always leading in the fight, in that battle. Then the land gets to rest. And now it's time to divide the land to each tribe. God always gives rest to those who come to him through Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ said that his yoke was easy and his burden was light. If you think when Christ said that, what's the contrast to the most religious, strict, religious people of the Lord's day? The scribes and the Pharisees were the ones who put a yoke that could not be carried and a burden upon the people that was crushing. And Jesus said, follow me and I will liberate you. I'll liberate you through suffering. When our nature is changed, when we are born again, the burdens that the world sees in following Jesus, the yokes that the world sees, they're not confining, they're liberating, and they are, in fact, a delight. Now, notice also what he says, that this inheritance has come into view. Joshua took the whole land according to the Lord, uh, said, and what he said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel. Now, as far as our sequence of events, that's the very next thing, but we've got some other chapters that we've got to cover in the meantime. And so when we begin to look at all this and see this inheritance and what takes place, I'm not going to get into all of that just yet. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more general and kind of try to look at the big picture, the narrative that's coming up. And so the screen that you see in front of you, I'm not going to deal with all of that so much because in chapter 12, you get a list of all of the kings that have been defeated throughout Canaan and even on the other side of Canaan. In fact, the first part of the list in chapter 12 covers the kings that Moses destroyed on the other side of Jordan. In the second part of the list, you have 31 kings and their cities that are mentioned that Joshua defeated and that he conquered and became the spoil of Israel. Then you know what? Chapter 13. I ought to put that up on the screen because it's amazing. In chapter 13, God tells Joshua that he's old and well stricken in years. <laughs> what, what does that mean? He was at least 100 years old, more than likely. And God is the one that tells him he's old and stricken in years. But then he says, but there's a lot of land to possess. So even though here we have the land rested from war, it's only temporary. Because in short order, even in his old age, God reminds him that there's some battles still to be fought and some land still to be possessed. We'll get into that later. The point to be made is for you and I, Christian, the fight is never over. Not while we're alive in this body and on this planet. But the victory is always guaranteed in Jesus Christ, by Christ, and through Christ. Now, I've pretty much gone through all of that lesson. 
in a narrative form, just telling you the story and giving you a few short words. Now, most people know when I teach and preach, I use an outline. And so some, because you're writing and you're writing notes, may be fit because, well, what's the outline? I don't see it. Well, I always like to give you an outline. So you ready for it? And I'll sum it back up, which is this way to surprise lesson. First of all, you see the power of the enemy. You see the enemy getting everybody else together and coming against you. You see how big they are. They're how powerful they are, how prepared they are for battle. That's the way it is against you and I, Christian. But we have the Lord who is in us, who is greater than he that's in the world. Then what happens? The enemy fights against us, but then you have the promise of God. You have the promise that don't be afraid. I got your back. In fact, I got more than your back. I've got your front. I'm going to fight them with you, and I'm going to enable you to fight them, and I'm going to fight in front of you. Then you see the piety of Joshua, meaning that he obeyed everything that God bade him do. In fact, everything, that word, everything God said to do, Joshua did it. Everything that Jesus was committed to doing was part of that eternal covenant of redemption. Jesus Christ did it for us. And we, though we know we cannot be completely obedient, we can be through Christ. Then you see the providence of God. God hardened the heart of those kings. Well, when you think about that, <laughs> the one thing that kind of bothered me, it's like, okay, harden the heart of those kings so that you'd have to fight him. That providence meant there was a providential battle in your future. That means, dear friend, Christian, you have a providential battle. But you can win that battle. You can be victorious in that battle. And that battle will give you the spoils and the inheritance that God has promised you. Then you see the persistence of Joshua. Again, he made war a long time. Whether it was five years or seven years, that's a long time to be away from your family, be able to visit just a bit and come back and be in the battle. And remember, there were those who were on the other side of Jordan said, oh, we won't delay. We'll come with you. They were committed. This was Joshua's persistence and these men's persistence to fight until the battle was over. And then lastly, the portions distributed. The portions, of course, were the inheritance of the land. Well, we don't have a land. We're not part of this promise of Israel. But when Jesus Christ died and rose again, he gave gifts. He gave us the ability to minister to others. That's our portions that God has distributed to us so that we can rest in him, work in him, but remember again, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The conquest of northern Canaan is full of rich lessons for you and I. Go back, read it for yourself. Let the Spirit of God illuminate those passages that might encourage and help you as you fight your battles of the flesh. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you.